Uh, welcome everyone uh, to The Nudge, the second panel of today. Uh, we're going to follow up from this morning's discussion on uh, changing our vocabulary for the better, becoming users again and not just people. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, investigating uh, persuasive technology, so using technology or computers, computers, sorry, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, to change how we think and act. Um, we're going to look into the psychology um, that informs interface design and in specifically uh, which industries use this the most, which is uh, advertising industry, online advertising industry. And we're going to start with a look at neuromarketing. Uh, is it hype or is it real? How much of it uh, uh, works and, and how does it work? Um, and um, yeah. Uh, we will very much look into the implications of these business models uh, on people and uh, society. So I'm going to introduce you to the moderator, uh, Nadine Roestenburg. Uh, she's a researcher and curator interested in the influence of digital technology and internet on art, culture and society. She studies post-digital cultures and focuses on the relations between well-being and the internet and reflections uh, emerging from the contemporary arts. This research is based at Fontes University of Applied Sciences within the Fontes Broad Interdisciplinary Research Team, Creative Economy. So we have a warm welcome for Nadine Rustenberg. Thank you, Manoush. And thank you, Impact, for the invitation. And thank you all for being here yes, with so many people. Um, it even makes me a bit nervous, but uh, so then that said. Um, <laughs> It's gone, yeah, that's what makes us human, right? And today we're going to talk about the nudge. And um, as Malus already told a bit uh, about it, there's a growing field of research look, looking at how websites, computers, software, mobile devices can be used to change people, uh, people's behavior. And uh, obviously that can be changed in many directions, uh, good uh, directions, bad directions. Um, and we're going to look at um, how this works and also who decides um, yeah, who is being nudged at what time. And um, questions that will um, arise is if this is a pure hype and even if it were 100% marketing, what would happen if these models are implemented in cities, homes and websites? Um, so we have three speakers today. We'll start with uh, Steven Scholter who can set up uh, his presentation already. Uh, I'll introduce him in a bit. And then we have Lydia Pereira and Fike Jansen. And so the flow of topics will be that we're first going to look at what is neuromarketing and how does it work. Then we're going to look at the business models that uh, use nudging and how does it work in practice. Um, looking at Facebook as an example, the patents of Facebook. Um, and what are the consequences of applying such business models to society, uh, regardless of whether the nudge works or not. Um, but first, um, I'll introduce Steven Scholte, Dr. Steven Scholte. He's an associate professor of cognitive neuroscience at Amsterdam University. He studied a lot, biology, psychology and philosophy, and he obtained his PhD in medical physics. Um, recently, his work has shifted towards computational models of cognition and visual perception and the philosophy of science. And he is also the CAO of a market research company, Norensics, that specializes in consumer neuroscience. Please welcome Steven Scholte. Thank you for the int introduction and inviting me. Uh, I'm going to give a short primary in consumer neuroscience and also, let's say, a short overview of how, well, a, a broad, in very broad strokes, how, the mind, how a part of the mind works. I can't make that small enough. Okay, so I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to discuss four different topics, automatic first controlled processing, associative learning, how this relates to brands, or so a certain view on brands, and I'm going to give some examples of how consumer neuroscience is being used. Now, to start with automatic first control processing, um, we live in a very rich world. Lots of stuff is going on, lots of stuff is entering uh, our brains or our minds, uh, and we can't process that all. Uh, st stuff happens all the time, uh, and, and our brain is optimized to process this information efficiently. 
So this is, uh, let's say, well, this would be a, an example of eyes. There's visual input. This is the early part of visual cortex. It's the early part of visual cortex of a monkey, not of a human. Humans are a bit more complex even, but monkeys are a bit easier to study. And uh, information comes in here. And so, so if you look under the hood, under the hood, under the hood, you have a view like this. Information comes in here, and uh, an image goes through the system at each step there is what you could say information selection. Some information is amplified, others information is suppressed. And at the most basic unit, you could say that each neuron firing is a decision in information processing. And so in that sense, millions and millions or hundreds of millions of decisions are being made every 10 to 100 milliseconds. It's not a conscious decision. It's not even, an old, it's not even a subconscious decision, but decisions are being made all the time. And we should be quite happy that we're not aware of that. <laughs> and at this level of description, it's not meaningful to use terms as decision, automatic, or consciousness. And so you want to move away a bit from, uh, and uh, what we can do, and it's kind of informative, if that, and then uh, I'm zooming in on other image of the brain. And so this part, this wiring diagram, more or less corresponds to this part of the cortex. If you look at the back of the brain, the posterior part, you could say that these processes are kind of rapid. They have very little memory. It doesn't matter for what goes on here now, what happens have happened a second ago. And for processes in the more frontal parts of the brains, it does matter a lot what happened earlier on in time. And so it might not that meaningful to distinguish between, let's say, conscious versus automatic, but we at least at this level of description can talk about fast versus slower processing. And then slower, not necessarily it's the processing itself is slower, but it's the consideration over what is considered is much longer. Now, a much more easy way and robust way to interface with, let's say, the brain is a description of the mind is at this level. It's a Danny Kahneman's description of a system one and system two, not his choice. And then you have a system one, which is far, fast, automatic. It processes emotions and it's not under conscious control. It doesn't mean that the outcomes are unconscious. We know what you are conscious of the outcomes of system one. You're just not conscious or you can't influence those processes. And there's system two. It's controlled and slow enough to become uh, conscious of the elements within the system that you can actually interact with it. And you can think within a system two context or metaphor, you can think of, okay, um, I might want to change this. I want to change the output. I'll do this or I'll do that. Now, this is beautiful. This is really, uh, given that we live in a dynamic world, given that uh, we are not ants that are, let's say, more or less automatic, it, it's really handy that uh, you are bestowed with a system that, and then let's take as a metaphor learning to dri drive. Uh, when you start learning to drive, you are very much in conscious control of driving. Everything that you do, you think, of, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It's a very conscious process. But if you do that long enough, if you do that often enough, it becomes automated. It moves from being controlled by system two, or a large part of that, moves by being controlled by system two to being controlled by system one. Same for playing the piano, same for most of our activities. And so moving, having system one and having system two is actually a very smart way of being able to learn new tasks and everything of that task that can be automated will be automated if you've done it enough, moving it from system two to system one. Now, and if you want to point this on the brain, and this is a horrible metaphor, because if you look at the description of the brain, it doesn't map one to one. The more frontal, oops, the more frontal parts of the brain are involved in system two type processing, and the back of the brain and the bottom part of the front of the brain are more involved in system one processing. Now, if you think of this metaphor, or if you think of this system, and certainly in this context, it's kind of relevant to ask the question, what does system two want? And system two is this rational, in control thing. It's almost a Vulcan. It doesn't really want anything. It's passionateless. Uh, it's logical. Um, and then in this context, uh, let, let, let's say that we're talking about nudges, and we're talking about system one and system two, who is being nudged where and what would be the alternative? 
we're missing something here. And what we're missing is values and goals. Now, let's move towards associative learning. It's, it's the, 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 the third element. It, 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 even at the more broadest strokes, strokes at looking at the mind, we need to talk about how we obtain values, and, and we, for a large part, obtain it via associative learning. If you look at mammals, mammals are born with basic innate values. They're not associative learning, they're the other part, they have innate values, and they typically seek, we get primary reward for stuff like sugar, fat, the taste of umami, safety, touch, sex, forms of social contact. The list is not fully explored, but there's this stuff that automatically gives you work. It's probably wired. And there's stuff that you typically avoid in primary punishments. They are pain, isolation, stress. These are probably, there's no direct proof of this, but you find this very robustly across a large species of animals, basic uh, values, innate values. But everything else we learn mainly by association. It's not a novel idea, it's something already suggested by Aristotle, Hume, Locke. Uh, our minds connect events together. And once you have these basic innate values via the process of associative learning or reinforcement learning, you can pair these basic values with novel things. And then these novel things, if they coincide often enough with the outcome of a specific primary reward, themselves will get you that reward. Uh, and again, that's rather crucial in a complex society as we have. And so you're now all sitting here in an audience, and I'm presuming that somewhere in the next one and a half hours you'll think, okay, that's why I'm sitting here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I, 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 this is a meaningful experience for me. Uh, I, I'm getting a positive reward for myself. And this is not being ingrained in your DNA. You were not born with that the moment you sit here, you get this rewarding feeling. That is an effect of a long social history, a long learning history of associative learning. But these are, in all likelihood, very much built on top of these <laughs> innate basic values, and why association on top of association on top of association, very abstract things also become valuable. And if we look at the brain, we actually can differentiate between two different circuits. There's a reward-based associative learning circuit, which basically deals with stuff like food. And, uh, interesting. There's a social-based associative learning part, which, based, with, which deals with social processes. These, are close to, these, these functional networks are close together to each other, but they are separated from each other. And uh, with these networks, you have the capability to dynamically learn value, and this is one of the pillars that allows to have a complex society. Something like social trust and the way that you get that social trust or money or love of freedom are derived, learned concepts. Uh, but by, interesting, by an intrinsic associative learning history, they are originally or in the basic linked to those innate learned values. Now, it's actually kind of clear for all sorts of reasons that I'm not discussing here that the networks involved in this, and at least in the reward-based associative learning, are, well, the part of the brain here that is kind of yellowish and reddish. That is the front of the brain. And, and how do we know this? Or an interesting example of how do we know this? And it also brings us back to the question, what does a Vulcan want? Uh, probably, I'm going to show you two examples of stuff that you've seen before. They're very typical, but I need them here on the slide for the next slide. Uh, there have been these moral dilemmas that you can give to people. So let's say that you're standing on a bridge and there are five uh, construction workers working on uh, the railway here. There's this train coming and you can stop this train by throwing this man in front of the train. It's guaranteed that it will happen. And you can ask a person, will you throw this person? Well, let's do it. Who would, throw this per who would not throw this person in front of the train? Who would not? Okay. Who would? Which is, of course, the rational decision. You save five lives. You sacrifice one life. People, families at home. 
but most people would not do this. You can change this a bit, and you could say that, uh, and this is exactly the same dilemma. Let's say that uh, we now have a train, and the train is going in this direction. You know this. And there's one construction worker working here. And there's another track. Sorry, I'm saying the other way around. The train is going like this, and there are five construction workers working here. And there's one construction working worker here. And all you have to do is flip this switch, and the train will run only over this construction worker. <laughs> Who would flip the switch? <laughs> A large portion of people flip the switch. It's just an empirical observation. A lot of experiments have been done like this, and there are a lot of examples like this. So if you look at different examples, and you can make these uh, scenarios more extreme. And, uh, and here we have our bridge. Our bridge is here scenario 10. Uh, but we also have a scenario in which you have to throw a couple of people overboard to uh, save the other people in the boat. Uh, it, it, it converse, there's a higher conversion rate there. Uh, and then also sending soldiers out in front of uh, the troop to die, it's, it's, it's very accepted by people. Sure, it happens. <laughs> Again, empirical observation. Now, uh, if we look at the normal controls, we see they go like this. And so there, there's this ordering, uh, and the, the normal controls behave exactly like you do, so you could be normal controls. Uh, most of the normal controls would not throw a subject in front of the train, and most of the normal controls more likely would, would go for these scenarios. There's a group that deviates from this, and that's the group here in the black lines. These are our Vulcans. They just follow strict logic. Five people, one people, <laughs> throw the guy in front of the train. And who are they? They are people with damage in the frontal or medial prefrontal cortex the area directly implicated in, let's say, learning these higher order values. Uh, I, I would say the areas that differentiate us from Vulcans. Uh, and uh, to go back to our metaphor, this area actually falls under system one. And these are our values, our emotions, our stuff. They are activated automatically. Uh, you do not learn them entirely automatically, just like you do not learn the stuff in system one automatically. It goes via system two but over a course of time it enters system one. Okay, this is a very, very coarse description of the brain and I need to hurry up. <coughs> okay, <laughs> uh, I'm quickly going over our next two things, brands. Uh, and I'm just having this here because I really like brands. And I like brands for a reason that probably you would estimate wrongly. So a brand is a name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's goods or services as distinct from those of other sellers. Now, historically, brands have developed to communicate for, let's say, the upper crust of society, exclusivity and differentiation, but for everyone, safety and level of quality. In a large society, it is difficult to guarantee quality and safety. It just doesn't happen quality and safety without having a brand. That's how brands originally developed. Not to give a Prada emotion to God knows fucking what, but to give a lower middle class person safe butter. And safety, quality, service, differentiation, and innovation are hard to arrange in large scale society, given that the average consumer also has these products or has access to the products without a brand. Now, within the framework I've just described, well, Within the framework I just described, value of brands is learned via associative learning. And if this is true, a brand experience must have a real reward value. Now, I'm going to give an example. Of, this is one of my favorite experiments. Consumer neuroscience is actually not my main topic of research. My main topic of research are deep neural networks and learning within these net networks. But this, this test, I, I, I hope you'll be as enthusiastic as I am about this experiment in one slide. So in this experiment, people were given uh, wine, and they were told this wine was either very expensive or very cheap. Of course, it was the same wine. Uh, and there were two different conditions. There was a five, the certain wine was given on $5 or $45 or $10 and $90. There was a control wine of $35. And with the pricing information, people indicated that they liked the expensive wine more than the cheap wine. <laughs> they tasted the exact same wine. <laughs> Sorry. With surprising information, people indicated that they liked the expensive wines more than the cheap wines. Of course, there are two possible scenarios here. One scenario is here that they're basically snobs. 
they don't really like the wine, but they say, I really like the wine because it's more, well, I'm, whatever, a snobbish explanation. The other explanation is that it's really more appreciation. Now, this experiment was done in the MRI scanner. In the MRI scanner, we can evaluate a region called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex that we just encountered, which is very predictive of whether someone appreciates something or not. And then if we compare our 5 euro versus our 45 euro wine, the time course of that, we see that our 45 euro wine has a much stronger activation in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Same for the 90 euro wine versus the 10 euro wine. It's a more, more extreme effect even. This experiment suggests, and as far as, let's say, you can make an inference from brain science towards actual behavior, which is not necessarily trivial, but as far as you can do it, this experiment strongly suggests that the wine of 90 euros, or Brenda's 90 euros, is actually also appreciated more in terms of, let's say, an intrinsic value. Now, I'm going to give you two, two ends. I'm going to give you two examples of consumer neuroscience. So, these are two, and these are not the two examples, these are two pictures. One picture is from a Clockwork Orange, the other is from the island of Dr. Monroe. Both are fantasies of directors. I guess one of the directors is a better director than the other director, but they're both fantasies. Equally so. The examples of consumer neuroscience. So, uh, what has been a very influential experiment is that it turns out it would be possible to predict which of, uh, using only 27 teenagers, which music songs will be a success in the United States. And, and again, you just measure the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, higher activation, stronger preference. It's not a gigantic effect. We're talking about here a mere 9% explained variance. But if you can kick out 9% of the uh, uh, songs, you'll have a more efficient market. This is another example of an experiment. Again, you measure the ventromedial prefrontal cortex in some other areas. You probe, well, which of these two, which of these four advertisement objects is the better advertisement object in predicting whether, uh, let's say, the T will sell more or less compared to the other options. And you see then that this one actually sells a bit better than the other three ones. Whilst, uh... now, to summarize. And so, and, and these are, <coughs> I, I, I said to the organizer, these are the boring examples of consumer neuroscience. This is basically what you do in consumer neuroscience. To summary, there is a fast and slow system in the mind. System 2 is value blind in terms of its goals, and these goals are learned by associative learning. Brands appear to add real value to product experience and neuromarketing. In general, it's just the same as marketing, and it is best application, just more valid and reliable. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, I'll ask you one question, if you can come over here, and then um, Lydia can uh, set up her presentation. And I forgot to tell you uh, earlier, uh, we will have time for questions um, after um, these talks. So can you please write them down and um, keep them up? Stephen, I have one question for you, because we were talking earlier a bit about nudging, and um, that it's also, you see this as a, ne a necessary um, process, that we need some guidance in, uh, for instance, if we're walking from A to B, on Schiphol, we are constantly being uh, persuaded and that this is necessary for us because otherwise our cognitive systems will be overloaded all the time. But um, if you want to show, oh, you want to, yeah, you can also have this microphone. But then the question is, if we're being nudged all the time, would there also be still space for things for coincidences or for uh, non-popular songs or tea or whatever in is the case? Um, we, basically, yeah. Without, uh, let's say, actually answering your question, given that in the specific example I gave you only 9% 9 9 of the variance is explained, yeah, there is lots of space for accident left. You could wonder whether you would want to enter, uh, you would want to explain 100% of the variance. What would the situation be then? That's not the case. Probably it's not going to ha actually ha ever happen there. But that's, that's just an accidental, just the way things are, not a conscious choice of anyone. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we continue now with uh, Lydia. And I have to take the right 
piece of paper, super smooth. Um, Lydia Pereira, she's an independent designer and researcher, uh, founding editor of the Persuasive Labour Union Zine, a publication focusing on the political uh, economy of the internet, algorithmic governance and labour in and around corporate social networks. Um, and today she will talk about the project uh, Object Oriented Subject, that is a co uh, sorry, collaboration with uh, Lucia Dussin, who is also here, I think. And for this project, they have screened Facebook by focusing on the interferences of personal attributes from user data um, for categorization purposes. And they kind of reversed engineered the um, patent patents that uh, Facebook uh, filed to manipulate or change behaviors, right? Yeah. More Applause. details on that later, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so here's Lydia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to be here today, yes. And so I'm here to respond to the topic of this panel, like uh, Nadine just said, by talking a bit about the research that Lucy and I have conducted with object-oriented subjects. And object-oriented subject is a research project that we initiated in 2017, and in which we try to understand the industrial processes of what has been called Facebook's algorithmic factory. So. After coming across a table uh, in a 2013 paper by Michal Kozinski, uh, David Stilwell, and Thor Grapel, which indicated that liking curly fries on Facebook might be a good predictor of a person's I IQ, we were intrigued how such inferences could be made from such uh, apparently innocuous data. And uh, yes, as David mentioned uh, in the previous panel, it, it doesn't suffice to look into the black box. So specifically, we were and are concerned with how such black box processes uh, reinforce and aggravate power and asymmetries and are consequently uh, very likely to contribute to further discrimination and exclusion. Oh well, so sadly, <laughs> oh no, not Cambridge Analytica again, yes. Sadly, <laughs> within this context, it is almost impossible not to mention Cambridge Analytica. And I won't bother you with all the gory details, also because I don't remember all of them anymore. <laughs> but when the scandal came to light, uh, Lucy and I were already knee deep, knee deep in this research. And that is why I apply the air quotes when I say scandal. Because sure, it is scandalous, not saying the opposite, but uh, yes, despite the horror and the scale of its tactics and end goals, Cambridge Analytica are certainly not the first, the, the ones to, to, to do this, the only ones to do this, and certainly not the pioneers in micro-targeting for political purposes. So, for today, we have prepared uh, three uh, patents for presentation which allowed us a little peek beyond the veil, insofar as we are allowed to actually peek beyond the veil, and which fit the theme of today, Persuasive Tech Club, the best. And note of warning, just because uh, technology is patented, or computer, no, technology is the word that I want to use here, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, it is being applied, it is being used. A lot of the company's patent is just to uh, safeguard their intellectual property. So there's no, we don't know exactly whether these are being applied or not. But yes, before we burn through them, uh, I want to have a look at the most basic building block of Facebook, which is the social graph, and the social graph, which comes from graph theory and uh, social engineering, uh, attempts to map everyone and everything on the internet. It is composed of nodes, which can be users, brands, groups, concepts, etc., and edges, which represent the different relationships between the nodes. And as we can see in this image, uh, edges can represent different relationship types. Friendship, like, cooked, uh, recommended, etc., etc. And hopefully the social graph will help us better understand the patterns. So, without further ado, uh, let's uh, dive headfirst into the first patent. And I have a nice tool. Oops. That actually made me change the thing by accident. <laughs> So, uh, the first one, which is advertisements for applications on an online social network, 
uh, we have at the center of it the social graph, because this one uses historical data from the social graph, that is the nodes and the edges, to uh, make a selection of a first set of concept nodes. And concept nodes, as we can see here, are not user nodes, but can represent an application, a website, game, brand, etc. And the selection uh, of concept nodes that are connected to users connected within a certain threshold to a first user and may be associated with an application accessible by the social network, for example, Spotify. And then, based on the connecting edges of these concept nodes, that is, based on the relationships of the different types of relationships uh, that we have just seen in the previous image, there is a second selection made of concept nodes from the first set, which is then used to target ads at the first user. So in this example, Judith and five other of your friends have listened to Africa by Toto on Spotify. And Africa by Toto and Spotify here being the concept notes derived from the second set of concept notes. Yes, one down, two to go. Predicting life changes of members of a social networking system. Uh, disclaimer. The application of this one has been declared abandoned uh, recently in October, but it was nonetheless published for the first time this year. And yes, uh, we were, regardless of, of this, we thought it was good to show, interesting to show the potential of what these technologies might achieve. So we have at the center of it all a life change prediction engine, which is a machine learning mod model that takes the communication met uh, no, sorry, communication data, action data, and the associated metadata of a list of users who have indicated a similar life change event. Then this machine learning model spits out the probability of a user of undergoing a similar life change event. That if it falls within a certain threshold, uh, the profile of this user is updated. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be visible, but it will nonetheless be used for targeting ads, not only to the user, but also to the friends of user. So here we can already imagine some problematic applications of this. Uh, in the case that the user went through a somewhat traumatic event, such as the death of a close relative, and is therefore in a very vulnerable state, which probably facilitates the persuasion. So. Before we dive into the, I don't need this yet, uh, before we go into the third and final patent, let us go on a seemingly diverting excursion to talk about the big five personality traits, uh, which uh, are also known as ocean. Uh, and the big five is a mostly Western taxonomy of personality traits uh, proposed somewhere in the 1980s. Uh, it consists of five main traits, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And uh, for each of the main traits, there are associated secondary traits, and you can score both, ne oh, not both, but either negatively or positively. Uh, so for example, if you score high on the neuroticism trait, it means, it might mean that you are more likely to be a depressive and insecure person, while if you score low on neuroticism, you're more likely to be fearless and shameless. Yes, uh, I think people are supposed to feel the judgment in this. <laughs> anyway, uh, as I have mentioned before, while not being the first ones to use such techniques, Cambridge Analytica created psychographic uh, profiles of Facebook users for the purposes of targeting political uh, messages. And as Alexander Nix, the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, can be seen bragging during his talk at the 2016 Concordia Annual Summit, the power of targeting based on psychographics surpasses the power of targeting on demographics alone. And so while demographics take into account things such as gender, age, income, education, etc., cetera, uh, psychographics take into account interests, activities, opinions, uh, and personality traits, uh, mostly using the Big Five model, which are also seen to be a good predictor for, again, a person's interests, activities, and opinions. And uh, there is, of course, uh, as, I, as it has been mentioned, uh, extensive debate regarding the effectiveness of such tactics when it comes to changing people's minds when voting. But regardless, the military undertones of such operations, uh, if we think, for example, of PSYOPs, as well as the immense wealth of knowledge, information, and control that we are providing these companies, platforms, and governmental entities with, are more than enough cause for concern. So, this being said, I can finally go into the final patent of the day, which is this one, determining 
why am I not seeing? Ah, there it is. Determining user personality characteristics from social networking system communications and characteristics. It's a bit of a mouthful. And at the center of it all, we have the user personality estimator, uh, which uh, takes into account linguistic data and non-linguistic data to predict the personality characteristics of a user based on the Big Five model. And it may use linguistic data sets, topic modeling algorithms, and other statistical um, models. And these predicted personality characteristics are then used for targeting, ranking, selecting content for presentation, and others. And uh, this one, uh, a Facebook uh, official spokesperson has said that Facebook has actually never uh, used this. I mean, we can have the, benefits, have the benefit of the doubt, uh, but in fairness, uh, the, the advertisers don't have a choice to yet, at, as we speak, target directly based on the big five. Facebook doesn't allow for that yet. So, further trying to understand the mechanisms that make such inferences, such as the curly fries and high IQ one possible, we came across yet another paper by Michal Kaczynski. And Michal Kaczynski is quite an important character in this story. Uh, well, he's now a researcher at the Stanford University, but when he was a postdoctoral scholar at the Psychometric Center of the University of Cambridge, he was approached by Alexander Kogan, which developed the app that fed Cambridge Analytica. And although he refused to collaborate with Alexander Kogan, uh, Kaczynski's and his colleagues' research nonetheless inspired, and I'm going to say inspired just because there's not enough time to go exactly into what happened, but it's not just inspiration. Well, it inspired the whole endeavor. And in this particular paper, uh, which is called Mining Big Data to Extract Patterns and Predict Real Life Outcomes, Kaczynski, alongside other researchers at uh, Stanford University, uh, they demonstrate how to obtain insights from large data sets. In this case, that we will be talking about from uh, Facebook likes. And the same sample data set used to build a predictive model in this paper contains the psychodemographic profiles, that is the big five personality traits, the political affiliation, the gender, and the age of over 100,000 Facebook uh, users and their Facebook likes. And these data were obtained by the researchers via an app. And I think this can sound a bit familiar already. So let's see how it works. For the sake of simplification and illustration, the authors first use a fictional data set to explain exactly how these methods are working. So in this case, we have seven fictional users and six movies. And to make this even extra, extra clearer, I'm going to take as an example Noah, which likes aliens and Star Wars, and Tom, which likes uh, true romance, pretty woman, aliens, and Star Wars. And this is another way to visualize the same concept of users liking different movies. And uh, one of the methods that used in the paper, and only one of the various possible statistical methods to extract patterns from large data sets, is LDA, or Latent Didelecht Allocation, which is a topic model that groups objects according to their similarity. And in this case, it will take the user's likes matrix, that table that we have just seen, as one of the parameters, and the variable k, which indicates the number of topics to be extracted. And the value of k, there's, of course, a lot of methods to select it, but it will influence the quality of the outcome. And it will produce two tables, uh, users in topics and movies in topics, and the value of k that Kaczynski and his colleagues selected for this first run was three. So there will be three topics. So here we see the users in topics, and here we see the movies in topics. And each object belonging to each of the topics uh, is given a weight from zero to one. So if you remember Noah, Noah likes Star Wars and Aliens. He sits squarely and fairly on topic one. Uh, I can use this again. Is the is it's here with 0 0.99. And Tom, who likes four movies, uh, Alien, Star Wars, uh, Perfect, I don't remember, Romance and uh, Pretty Woman, is on topic one and on topic two. And if we look at the uh, other table, movies on topics, indeed, True Romance and Pretty Woman, topic two, Aliens and Star Wars, topic one. So this is, of course, an oversimplification but it serves to illustrate a point a bit. And here is another visualization of the outcome of these two tables. 
And now it comes to the second uh, task that the paper wants to, to, to accomplish, which is to visualize the correlations between the topics extracted from user likes and some known properties of the users. If you remember, I mentioned these psychodemographic profiles that contain the big five personality traits, the political, the age, and the uh, um, gender. And yes, so uh, in, at this point in the paper, Kaczynski and his colleagues take into account this predictive uh, data set of a ho over 100,000 users. And they produce this heat map, which, oops, sorry, which uh, is a way to visualize these correlations. And I'm going to tell you exactly what means what, so it's easier for, for reading. So, well. The more, the more saturated the color, the stronger the correlation between the topic and the trait. So we can see here we have gender, oh, gender, age, political affiliation, and ocean, or the big five model, openness, conscientiousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, for the personality traits, uh, the color represents a positive or a negative correlation. So blue represents a positive correlation, and red represents a negative correlation. And for the other three, uh, political affiliation, age, and gender, red represents a young and male Democrat, while the blue represents the opposite. Okay, again, to make this even more clear, there's another uh, table uh, in this paper, which is the likes most strongly associated with the five LDA clusters. And let us imagine if we take uh, LDA tree, or topic tree, as, an, as our reference, if you, as a Facebook user, uh, have a lot of likes coinciding with either Futurama, The Onion, Barack Obama, The Lord of the Rings trilogy, or Harry Potter, which are the, the ones that <laughs> predict uh, belonging, or most likely to predict a belonging to a certain topic, you might be placed indeed in topic three, and you might in be inferred to be uh, an older uh, Democrat male, which scores high on the openness. So you're a high, like, highly open person to new experiences, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how these inferences are happening. So to conclude, we, I'm so sorry, just getting my papers in order. To conclude, uh, we have looked into one method being used in one specific situation involving Facebook. But there is a huge variety of methods and contexts, and of course, other agents as well. And this is but a tiny, yet hopefully illustrative uh, snapshot. So if you are interested in knowing more about this research, you can consult our uh, website here. I'll give you some time to take pictures. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for yeah, your attention. So, um, I think you can set up the presentation. Okay, we'll keep your questions um, for the end. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so, Vicky Jansen is the next uh, speaker. And uh, she's a PhD candidate at the Data Justice Lab at Cardiff University. Um, where her research focuses on the impact of the implementation of data-driven decision-making by European police forces vis-a-vis -vis marginal communities. Um, before, she has worked on issues related to digital security, uh, responsible data management, privacy and human rights for the NGO Tactical Tech and the Dutch development organization HIVOS. And today she will talk about the impact of uh, persuasive technologies on larger social, uh, economic, political questions. Thank you, Fika. Okay. Or <laughs> enjoy Fika's presentation. Uh, thanks. So uh, I indeed now look at how police are using tech, but then uh, this presentation sort of is uh, more from the 10 years of experience that I had of uh, working and politicizing and unpacking technology uh, for people, for human rights defenders and journalists and other people. And sort of um, when Marloes asked me to give this presentation about persuasive technology and nudging, the first thing actually that came to mind was, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you go, for instance, through and you go through that very annoying process where you have to like take everything out of your bag, you have to like uh, stand like this and they go, bloop, bloop. 
And then at the end, when you have everything collected again and you feel very dehuman, you get this very nice thing with like three smiley faces, green to red, and they're like, how did you judge our surface? <laughs> and for me, this was the first thing I had to think about when I was thinking about nudging, because actually you're in a position where you have no agency, where there's quite a lot of repression going on, and then by pressing these button buttons, you're supposed to have a more positive feeling or a feeling that you can actually change anything in the service. So it's for me, it's like Schiphol is the ultimate paradise of nudging, but then in the, in the real world. Um, and when you talk to people who are not from the Netherlands, they always refer to Schiphol as the place where they have a fly in the toilet in the men's urinals, so that people pee straight instead of pee like next to the urinals, which is also a way of nudging people to do something the way Schiphol likes you to do it. So I don't know, I just had this imagination about Schiphol, and then I thought, oh, I have to talk about tech, uh, because uh, it, nudging and technology, they go quite hand in hand together. And sort of my third imaginary that I got was about Cambridge Analytica, which I knew you were going to talk about. But it was in a very different context, because for my work, I actually landed in New York the day that Trump got elected. So I spent quite a lot of time there talking to activists and scholars. And what I found fascinating about all the sort of social scientists who were working on data and technology, the weeks after that Trump got elected, all they were thinking about is looking for a reason why Hillary lost and Trump won. And sort of like, I feel like this overemphasis on uh, Cambridge Analytica also came from this desire to find a reason why people voted for a candidate that we might not agree with. Um, and especially because in the same sentence, they always said, these people in the flyover states, so they're already quite derogative towards them. Uh, so I had like all of these things in mind, and then I thought, hmm, OK. Um, so my title's Blinded by Technology, because I feel like we get blinded by technology. We, we fail to see the power structures behind it, because we get shiny new tools, or people make us believe that technology can actually do something. Um, and I want to talk about the user, sort of the imaginaries we have around nudging, and then some of the issues. Um, and then I think we'll go into the panel discussion. So why I want to talk about the user is because we all have a lot of ideas about this user. Uh, the user has to do this, the user gets nudged, but what does the user actually know about technology? We sort of, this is something that I started to question because, well, here's the first slide, but... Um, when I was doing trainings around privacy and digital security and teaching people tools, we would use to, in these workshops, start with asking people, can you please draw the internet for us? And actually, for us as trainers, this was a way to see how much people knew about this, how much people knew about the internet. And these are some, this is a drawing that actually comes from one of these workshops. And it's surprisingly to say how many people drew clouds, stars, all of these things, but nobody actually drew the physical infrastructure. So when you start asking people to make choices or be more aware that they're being nudged, you have to understand that this is the imagination that they get when we talk about technology, instead of actually seeing sort of the server farms, uh, sort of rows of servers, and really the physical cables, there's an imaginary that technology is somehow mythical. Then when you talk about data or like how data can influence our lives or the role of that Facebook plays in our lives, if you ask them to do the same, they will come up with like just the, the, the sort of the interface, like, uh, or it's an emotional thing. It connects me to my community. If I leave Facebook, it's sort of like I lose part of my friends. I don't know what's going on. So there's a lot of emotions involved. And then if you look behind it, it's sort of, uh, this is a project by Share Lab uh, based in Belgrade. And they did the same, so they analyzed patents. And so they looked at like, uh, what would the algorithmic factory be like looking at Facebook by going through a lot of patents that they found. Uh, and it's far more complicated than just the emotions that we express. So every time when we talk about sort of uh, the user, we have a lot of assumption about them. We feel that they should be responsible, that they should make sort of uh, rational choices and all of this. But how can we do it when we don't understand any of the stuff behind it, and we just interface with it either by thinking it's mythical or by an emotional association. And this comes to the imaginaries. And I think um, sort of one problem about technology and also about uh, the interface between technology and nudging is that we have a lot of imaginaries about what it is, uh, that it has abilities to make us do something, that it has abilities to predict uh, and I love Dick's example it was in 2014. This uh, research, got, research came out and it said, 
Twitter knows when you're depressed. So basically they did a sample where they had uh, analyzed tweets of people that later claimed on Twitter that they were depressed. And they said with 70% accuracy, we can predict that somebody will become clinically depressed. And this was in 2014 in all the tech magazines. Twitter can predict that you get cl clinically depressed. So the first question is, why should a company know this? I mean, even if it works or not, this should be the question. And then the second question is, what are they going to do about it? Are they going to send you a tweet and say, hey, go see a doctor? Are they going to nudge you in this direction? Or are they going to use this and sell to advertisers and say, hey, somebody's depressed. Maybe they're mo more emotionally unstable so we can sell certain things to them. So I think like this question is like, that wasn't asked. It was all about, ooh, look at this shiny new cool tool that Twitter can do and they can diagnose you as clinically, like, clinically depressed. And then um, I asked some of my friends who, was, who were working at Twitter, uh, because this digital rights space is not so big, and I said, so what's the deal with this study? And basically they said, yeah, I mean, inside of Twitter we all laugh about it because it's bogus, but somehow the media picked it up as if it's a thing as if it's actually real, as if actually we are taking the sample and then looking at all these tweets and saying these people are clinically depressed. So we have these imaginaries about companies that have an ability to do something based on the data that we have without ever sort of questioning this assumption or then questioning what they're going to do about it. And I think it's something similar now where uh, I talked to this researcher who's looking into sort of these period tracking apps. So for people who want to get pregnant, they can, for instance, track their period to see when they're fertile. And then uh, they sell this data to advertisers because in your period, you're more emotionally unstable, so you're more likely to do impulsive purchases. And sort of, I think these are some of the fundamental questions we never ask because the way we interface with technology is that the notch tells us, oh, maybe now you can, like, go have sex because you can get a baby, but actually what's being happening on the other side is far more intrusive. And then I think this is uh, one of my all-time favorite projects as well. It's called the Unfitbit. Um, so I would look it up. It's, bit, it's created also by some artists in New York. And um, what I like about Fitbit is that there's a notion about sort of this ideal version of health. So again, it's this notch, like we have to take 10,000 steps. So it tells you like how far you are, nice colors, you're almost at your goal, congratulations. Um, and sort of you see this slightly slowing from sort of a gadget that people want to now in certain countries you can actually get discount on insurance if you use this and you share your data with insurance companies because it's supposed to be like the new standard of health. And you don't have to do a lot of digging when you see actually that these 10,000 steps are just an arbitrary number selected by a Japanese uh, uh, designer who created the first uh, Fitbit. So it's like uh, it's a completely arbitrary number that has now been uh, created into some sort of standard because, like, uh, if you get a, because you get a discount on insurance. So somebody created a standard of health. Um, and why this is really funny is because I think uh, some of this art has a role to flip the uh, dynamics, to sort of show you the other side. So here they created all spoofing devices on how to think that your Fitbit is actually, that you're super active by making your Fitbit uh, collect sort of points or steps uh, so that then your insurance company would think or your employer would think you're very active. Um, and they have very di different do-it-yourself tools about this. So these are quite sort of obvious examples where you can think about like what are the issues around it. Uh, but I want to give two other examples that I might, there's, there's more layers to it. So this is another art project. Uh, and here I bring some of the policing in. But uh, if you start working in the data and policing field, everybody talks about minority report. And if you look at a lot of uh, research that's being done, it looks at predictive policing. So based on historical data set, we can predict Mo the likelihood that crime will happen in a certain location. <laughs> and so just to give you some of this background, all of this technology is used on one particular type of crime. So it's always used on sort of uh, mugging on the street, burglary in your house. So it's targeting a specific demographic and a specific type of criminal. And so, uh, and what it does is like, or what it, there's an assumption of what it will do, which I debunk in a moment, is that you have police driving in their car and they have these maps that get updated continuously and say, you should drive left here, take the first street on the right, and then there is something that is likely to go happen. So if you happen to be somebody walking there who fits the profile, they might ask you questions, harass you, or do something else. And so then uh, these three artists said, 
what if we apply the same logic, but we apply it to white collar crime? So we flip it to financial fraud. Then where is this fraud most likely to happen? And of course it's gonna happen in Manhattan because this is where all the banks are. And so they've, then the second thing they did is what they scraped on LinkedIn. They scraped the faces of bankers. And so they made a profile of the most likely suspect based on historical data that we know this is the most likely person. He's about 40 white male. And then, so it could still nudge a police officer to patrol the streets of Manhattan and sort of harass any person that looks like this. But as a society, we find this unacceptable. We would find it unacceptable for the police to walk up to one of these people and say, hey, can you give me your phone? Hey, what are you doing here? Hey, I saw your sister on this corner as well. Why was she here? <laughs> so with this nudging comes a lot of sort of political uh, baggage as well that we we most of the time don't think about because we just take it for granted. And then the funny part was when I asked European police if they also use this, so they, they use some predictive policing but then in a different way, they said they couldn't because the high impact crime, is the rate is too low, so you can actually not make these predictions. <laughs> Plus the, the police officers were too stubborn when they were given a map and said you have to patrol these streets, they were like, yeah, I know my neighborhood, I am not gonna patrol these streets. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's also, you also have to take cultures and values into account. Then there's also unintentional stereotyping. So maybe nudging people to, or to, like reinforcing the attitudes that they have about themselves. And sort of Sophia Noble uh, wrote this book about algorithm of oppression, and it came from a frustration. And I think this is quite nice because a lot of these uh, investigations come from frustrations. So what she did was like, she was looking for uh, something to do for her daughters and she typed in uh, black girls. And all she got was the first results on Google were like porn sites. Because of course, black girls are associated with porn sites. If you type in white girls, you would get a very different uh, search result. So it might not, so it reinforces the attitude about how you believe by yourself, how, how you sort of view yourself or how other people view yourself. Um, this is also when you just typed in children, you see like very nice, happy white kids, and then you sort of see people of a darker skin and they all look a bit like, either they're mugshots or they're like different pictures, but you could see really the difference in it. Uh, there's like, uh, and so she did a whole range of experiments. And what is interesting is that I don't believe Google set out to create an algorithm that stereotypes these type of like different types of ethnicities. And their first defense was, oh, this is just what people search for. So we are just representing what people are looking for. And then when it became public, of course they tweaked their algorithm. And now if you type in, why are black women so, you will not get angry or uh, lazy or confident because they tweaked the algorithm to make it more socially acceptable. Um, but I think there's a lot of unintentional nudging as well, and I think you talked about this uh, before in the break, that uh, of course we need to process information and there's a lot of nudging happening all the time, both in the physical and in the digital world. Uh, but I feel like we have to unpack this because there's, this can do very serious damage. If you are um, a young black girl and the only thing you see is sort of like, uh, uh, and you type for sort of your own demographic and you only see negative content, what is this gonna say when the entire world is already portraying you as a negative person? So then I have one minute left. Um, so I do feel we're blinded by the promise of technology. So actually we're creating the world that we're living in by believing in all of this hype. Because with Cambridge Analytica, did it really sway the elections? I don't know because I didn't do research into it, but so much money is being poured into it now because we all just don't want to accept that people voted for Trump. There's like, a, I think the Ford Foundation created a hundred million research grant to, to, to research fake news and uh, online manipulation. So it becomes a thing just because we wanted to. Uh, and I feel like we have to learn how to unpack this. We have to um, learn how to unpack technology and sort of maybe first make more conscious decisions before they move to the background. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Sika. Um, now I ask all speakers on the couch and I'll take this, the dangerous seat below the disco ball, in case we, won't, we were talking, but joking about it, that if someone might have uh, access to dropping the disco balls, <laughs> in case we say some, something someone doesn't like. Um, so we have this um, 
microphone catch box in case there's any I think there's plenty of questions uh, from the audience so um, but first maybe you want to react on each other's uh, presentation because I think there's a lot of um, ethical considerations about the nudge like the nudge itself holds this uh, this concept has uh, is loaded with the idea that a nudge is a steer in a positive direction uh, as opposed to uh, other ways of persuading um, people so um, maybe we can talk a bit about yeah how do you think we should decide and how can we um, do we need to, how much agency do we as users or consumers have and how can we reclaim this is um, we we think that it's we don't have the agency so maybe Stephen, you want to reply thank you <laughs> uh, yeah um, yeah um, the, sorry one second uh, so I think you actually made a very good point at your end of your well your entire presentation <laughs> of course but at the end of your presentation that you said that maybe we should consider things more explicitly before accepting the automaticity of it um, and I guess that would also be my answer to what you're saying I'm not I, I wouldn't necessarily see a nudge as a positive or a negative thing as is a constraint on information processing or a suggestion to constrain information processing um, but there's a a broad range in which stuff is happening and and I think it's sensible to or clearly sensible to first unpack more explicitly what's going on and then ideally you would either consent with a certain activity or not and then if you consent with a certain activity you have uh, the consequence of that so for instance with the online search uh, advertisement stuff uh, you can go to a website now and then can say well you want to uh, you're going to see some ads you want to have personalized ads or not well, that's a con at, at least that's a clear choice ideally you would quite like to have some information on what it then means to have a personalized ad if you would have that information then you you you, you at least can make an informed decision on that point. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah, so I think what is um, very <laughs> clear from all of your presentations is that a lot of uh, our thought processes that are not conscious, so how can we make them more uh, conscious by unpacking them, but how could we maybe implement this in... Um yeah, but at least, okay, but then we're not making one thing exactly clear, so we're presuming that there's some sort of idealized um, over, overview lord uh, on top of us that, that each of us has this, this this person in our cinema that actually knows what's going on and the per moment that that person is misled something goes wrong I can't loci locate that person I mean who is exactly uh, like within the, like the metaphor of the system one system two stuff and then system two would be this conscious overviewer this person has no idea of a lot of stuff and, and, and uh, he doesn't want or she doesn't want anything. Um, who, who is this objective observer with, with these innate values that get tainted by this nudging? I, 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 I don't believe in this platonic instantiation to start with. And if you presume that, that such, a, such a situation exists, then you have a very different, then you have a different origin point than if you presume, let's say, a more Aristotle, uh, a more empirical basis of who we are. Mm -hmm. I'm not that coherent, so maybe we should switch <laughs> to another person, but <laughs> what, what, what I'm trying to say is that we're presuming as if there's this objective truth and reality or, or a technology is just messing with that. The objective perfect self does not exist in that sense. I don't think so. Lydia, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know if it will make a lot of sense, but if I think of that, it's not that it, there is an objective truth that technology is messing with, but that technology is coming from a very yeah. one-sided, or most technology is coming from a very one-sided business model, and it aims uh, to, yeah, to profit and uh, at whatever costs and uh, whatever is the most effective in their in their view to to do that and of course there is a lot of marketing involved and like you mentioned indeed i don't know how effective indeed cambridge analytica was 
no idea, because I also didn't research that and there's still a lot of discussion. But we, sh we, sh we, sh we should still have a look at, who, at how much data yeah, we are providing and for what and for whose interests. And here the economical interests are really something to consider. So not an objective truth coming from above, but something more material. Yeah, I also wonder, like, uh, so for me, also listening to the other presentations, I wonder how far the discussion is not, I feel like the actual discussion should be about a clash of values, responsibility, all of these sort of things, like, uh, they're more, like, broader questions, maybe, because, like, I don't feel this is a tendency we do, we, we assume that the individual can, can navigate its way around, and then if they're uh, dumb enough to fall for the nudge, for instance, it's because they are not educated enough. But uh, like many things, also larger questions in society, we usually have uh, safeguards or like people steering us in a certain way, and then you can question if you want this. But I feel like there's a, a clash of values, and there's like uh, also a, a fight about responsibility. And as, especially in these platforms, nobody wants to take responsibility for any of the things that are happening. Um, yeah, so it's not an easy answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. And everyone ma wants to make money. Um, so is there other questions from the audience? Yeah, there is one right in the middle. I think exactly the middle. Catch it, if you can. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Maybe you, um, yeah. Uh, you said that these nudges are not specifically positive or negative, but the companies that you work for, that you do this marketing for, clearly do see this as positive or negative, positive being they buy the product, negative being they don't buy the product. Marketing has a lot of regulations, and you say this is just like marketing, but it uses completely different techniques. Do you think there should be regulations for this kind of marketing research, and if so, what kind of regulations? Um, it up. Uh, so my uh, regard, my concern with regard to nudges is that they can be both positive and negative, and they're not necessarily always positive or presumed to be positive. Was a general remark about nudges, and not something. Uh, of course, if a company uh, has a specific type of message that they nudge, they, they they prefer to have the positive side of it, and not necessarily the negative side of it. It's just I was just making the more general point that a nudge in itself does not have to be. Positive. Uh, then the question is, do I believe that there should be a different type of regulation for, let's say, consumer neuroscience than for marketing research? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think my answer there would be no. Um, I don't think that uh, there, there's marketing research that looks to see, well, what type of message does best uh, confer uh, a, a client has a certain ob objective that he wants to communicate that there's an association between, let's say, a value and a product. You want to see, you have a couple of different options. You want to see which of those options is better. You can evaluate that more or less effectively. I, I don't see a fundamental difference there in marketing or, or consumer neuroscience. What, what, what are you thinking of? Aren't you afraid of a dystopian future in which we can micro-target ads to every person separately based exactly on what would work for them. Would, would you not see that as a negative thing? Um, well, I, at least I wouldn't see it as a poss possible thing. Um, so let's say, okay, so let's say, I, I really don't believe the following, but you might believe that. So let's say that uh, you, I could show you an image. Uh, I have a really nice uh, or really fancy uh, brain scanner and a really smart algorithm. It generates an image and it image locks your behavior and then another image locks your behavior and then another image locks your behavior and another image locks your behavior and you basically, you cease to exist yourself. You're both fully driven by those images. I fundamentally don't believe that's possible. I also don't see what that has to do with the question. <laughs> oh, uh, you said uh, you have micro-targeting and then uh, things are become really uh, uh, effect, but effect. I'm not assuming that micro-targeting is something that immediately makes up your mind and does not allow you to make a decision, but it does influence your decision, which is just as dangerous, no? Maybe why? I should hand this. Hmm? Yeah, uh, I, I, I Because it is not our interest that is persuaded. It is in the interest of profit of capitalist companies that just want to make profit, no? Is it not a bad thing that these companies are continuously, I would, I would say for me at least, marketing in general is a negative thing. So, so, so you, you think brands are a bad thing? Hmm? You believe brands are a bad thing? 
I believe okay. under capitalist society, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, the, well, as I, as I showed in my slides, I, 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 yeah, I think brands have a lot of, let's say, a lot of value, especially for, let's say, uh, weaker consumers. So I would say that we have a fundamentally different view of society there. <laughs> Maybe, does anyone else here wants to, to yeah. reply on this question? <laughs> or we? No, I think, so the correspondent had a really interesting article about like online advertising and the merits of it. And, uh, and it's not the same as micro-targeting, but what was very interesting about it is they made this analogy after talking to a lot of people who were in the advertising industry, and sorry if everybody read this article, uh, but they made an analysis, like a comparison between two people flying for a pizzeria and like one person being super successful and the other person being less successful and sort of saying, uh, and the person who was very successful was flying outside the pizza store. Yeah, of course he's gonna be more successful because people are already intending to go there, so you just give them the flyer and then they get in and they get a discount. And if I'm standing flying at Central Station, there will be like a thousand other choices. So the chances that my flyer will actually get them to the pizzeria will be uh, sh uh, smaller. And what was interesting about this, that uh, some of these people in the advertising business did these experiments and they showed them for some very, two very renowned companies and they both just ignored it because they had to spend their advertising budget at the end of the year. And that is basically also reality, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there another question? Oh, that's hard to, tr to throw the micro box over there. <laughs> Um, I wanted to uh, kind of continue a little bit with that nudging question and the ethical uh, moral kind of um, connected to that. And I'm wondering, like, nudging is something very subconscious, right? We don't, we cannot, like, not be nudged in a way. There's no opting out kind of option to that. While marketing and targeting is very much, you can opt in, opt out to a certain degree by docking away, scrolling, not clicking, etc. So I'm wondering, like, how much awareness should the user, in your opinion, have about those nudging in order to regain a sense of agency, uh, sovereignty and identity within those um, systems? And uh, So it's almost like, do I have to announce a nudge and make it obvious that it is a nudge? But then it wouldn't not? be a nudge anymore, I think. But to yeah, that's be, are the you question. asking the question? So my question is essentially like, where do you... Oh, uh, just openly. I don't know to whoever up, wants to, to answer. Who wants to re reply first? Hmm. Well, I can try something. <laughs> well, there was a point that Fika mentioned that is really important, which is this uh, lack of knowledge of what exactly the internet is. And I think uh, a lot of uh, the influences that we are getting really border on this lack of information. I think you mentioned that as well. So indeed, I mean, it's not so much that nudge will eventually disappear or because we, will, we are always nudged and whatever, regardless of our intentions. I think uh, what we have to ask ourselves here, here is the, like, the scale of the nudge and from who the nudge is coming from. So not really, yeah, and in terms of education and literacy, of course. But who's the, responsible to know that? That's kind who, of my who question. Who is responsible yeah, who, to know? Uh, or who should be knowing, right? Who should be auditing? Like, is it the user? Who is it should the agency be auditing? Or the like. Yes, that's a tough one <laughs> because there's, of course, limits to uh, user auditing and limits to uh, independent agencies auditing. Because, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm coming from a very specific perspective because. I'll confess myself, I'm an anti-capitalist, so I don't think within this current system it is possible at all. So no. uh, this was a statement of intention, so maybe I can <laughs> open it up to other people. <laughs> so maybe the first thing is, uh, okay, first of all, uh, I'm gonna, make your question harder because uh, maybe ethics isn't the right approach and this is I find eth the ethical debate around technology very problematic because if you look how this debate is being funded it's all being funded by Google and Facebook so the question is is ethics then a, a prevention from actually making things law or like having sort of more um, harsher things about if we don't agree with something uh, so uh, ethics very so soon becomes sort of um, whitewashing or like self-regulation, all of these things, that means that they can keep on doing what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that the research is fraud that goes into it, but you see that this is 
being overrepresented now in sort of research, or we have ethics panels. There's so many like different ways in which ethics and technology are combined. Um, and I think the most interesting one is also the EU AI ethics high commission, uh, mm. where they created a nice document, you can agree with it or not, and then say, this said, and now we create something separate for a funding mechanism. So it means that none of the things that actually money gets spent on have to be applicable to these ethics regulations that they created and paid for. Mm. Uh, so I think ethics is problematic, and um, then who is responsible? I mean, yeah. That is a very, uh, I don't think anybody has the answer to this because nobody's claiming responsibility either. Everybody's responsib responsibilizing the user. How are we supposed to know that we're getting nudged? Whereas you can also say at certain things, we just draw red lines and we say, in these sort of cases, we can do nudging, we can't do nudging toward certain things. And this could be, for instance, for political campaigning, which is being discussed now in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can put the responsibility on some of these platforms because they're quite uh, optimistic out of any taking any responsibility saying it's too difficult they're not responsible for this content other people are placing it on them people can report them through community guidelines so maybe the first step is actually drawing red lines where we don't want certain type of nudging in society and then also being said like there's other information stream that people get so maybe you get things through Facebook which is nudging but then you also have other points through which you get information and we also always overlook this But then someone needs to draw the lines. Yes. <laughs> Who will do that? <laughs> I mean, in our in our current structure of society, it would be a government. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? So, here? secretly, this uh, microphone is just passed on to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you want you also have <laughs> a question but, or but, not? But perhaps so. I, I do actually. Okay. Um, Maybe you can have a question and then we move it to this link. Well, I'll, ke I'll keep it brief. Um, so considering um, people have been nudged for ages, uh, the, from the very first moment we, we inverted, invented uh, something like trade, do you guys feel there's, a, there's an essential difference between this day and age uh, and, and maybe 20 or 30 years ago? Because newspapers then ran ads that may have been indistinguishable from something that was informative. So what, what makes this age uh, any different? Okay, can I have this one? Yeah, I think you feel like you're really keen on that. Uh, yeah, I am. So go yeah. for it. Uh, so I would say that these times are very different because it is indeed, like I think 30 years ago, it was much more obvious when, when something was a nudge, or at least when something was an explicit advertisement. And currently, those, those boundaries are much vaguer now. And that does make the, that question much more different now than I guess any time in history. I mean, the advertisements were nudging, and it's been around since the Romans, the Greeks, probably earlier, but uh, the, these, these, these borders become vaguer. Um, I, as a general answer, uh, clearly I'm a classic liberal, I would say that the choices are, should always be with the individuals themselves, but they do need to know what's going on, otherwise they can't make a choice. And that's becoming more difficult now. So, so being a, a wise guy, um, when uh, earlier generations have said the same thing. So if someone has an infomercial on a television, something we're very used to right now, when the first people who uh, were presented with, uh, with these things, when they say the same thing, well, uh, commercials before this day and age were quite different and were very easily distinguishable. And uh, currently there's a generation of kids growing up who are getting better and better at noticing the times they will get nudged. Oh, or is this presumably you're right. And just now I was thinking of uh, smoking advertisements in the 50s that doctors were saying uh, that uh, smoking was uh, not, not clearly bad, but you did get smaller kids with it, which made uh, uh, <laughs> delivering the, the... Yeah, I guess that people in the 50s did not recognize that as an advertisement probably. So maybe you're a bit right. Okay. <laughs> So maybe you can throw uh, the microphone, and I promised that we would throw it over there to this lady. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> At least, yeah, I promised it. So I'll yeah. keep my promise. <laughs> okay, thank yeah, you. Go for it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, really fascinating uh, presentations, and I wondered, especially when you were presenting about neuroscience, to which extent do you think nudging kind of exploits our basic survival mechanisms? Because uh, there's also there was research done by Jennifer Light, who did research at Run Corporation, how military tech, military research was later appropriated by marketing, and I think that was almost visible in this example with the bridge throwing. Um, 
uh, I, I don't know, I, I made some <laughs> kind of connection, so maybe you could respond how you think how certain kind of intrinsic just uh, survival mechanisms yeah, relate to, to certain nudging mechanisms or certain kind of experience design that make, make us feel good to, yeah, to, to live. And the other questions, I think, what do you think is it about that we always try to externalize the responsibility also, or that we always see technology as external to us, even though it, it's created and then we try to blame Twitter or we, we try to blame technology or kind of see it separate. And I think that's, again, the kind of question of responsibility. And then also the question, what do we allow to, to survive in a sense? Do you still get the question? Yeah, at it's, least parts. It's, <laughs> it's a bit weird, uh, but to, yeah, to, uh, take what to, you... To, to start <laughs> at the beginning, uh, so the bridge is, I guess, a misunderstanding. That's actually an example for moral philosophy and not from mm. uh, marketing, um, mm. which were then used for neuroscience in a medical context. So that, that, it's really marketing unrelated. Um, I... No, I don't think that what's... No, if so, so... Uh, uh, the, the value structure that, for instance, brands use is, is I mean, as a basis, of course, has, uh, let's say, human functioning. Uh, but that, that, that's very derived stuff. I, I, I don't think that is very related to, let's say, basic instinct survival mechanisms or something like that. Uh, almost the opposite. Um, that's when you said like that, that yeah, we put maybe. trust in, value, uh, in brands and that allow us to make sure that this water is clean, that it's possible to, to eat. So, yeah, I, I just wondered yeah, oh, so, how this is. Uh, so that, that, that's an really element of, okay, that's an element of safety. Uh, I'll take that one and then, then, then move it on. So if you look at the history of brands, brands started in the 18th century or in the 19th century, or, or real brands, so no. Uh, so real brands that, uh, let's say, throughout a certain country, a, a brand existed, <laughs> emerged uh, as a function to basically communicate that uh, the butter that you got had a certain safety standard and a certain um, quality standard. Uh, that has nothing to do with, let's say, the art of marketing or something like that, but it, it does respond to a human need, uh, safety. And, and uh, I think one of the reasons I, I like a brand is that uh, at that level, brands have given, uh, let's say, the lower SES part of society actually a, a better uh, level of living. Um, that's the answer. Sorry. Yeah, OK. <laughs> we'll, we'll throw the Microsoft microphone to the next uh, question. Um, yeah, I was thinking, because there are so many things to be discussed here. But what you were saying, like with this um, peanut butter example, the safety or like um, the mark that something is, is, is put in potential safe to use, that might be that is also a nudge. Could we maybe use these kind of things, for instance, in Facebook pat patents? Could there be a safety mark or? I don't know if I understand the question completely. Like maybe, maybe if we, um, like for a lot of uh, consumer goods, we have, um, there's been a lot of research over the years. And so there's uh, levels or um, brands are marked Hmm. For instance, if uh, something is safe to use, could these? Could you think of something like a system uh, that values the patents or gives them labels in? In safe to use. Yeah, or. or um, <laughs> well, first we would have to be questioning who is actually applying these labels. Yeah. And who's influencing them to apply these labels and, and yeah, it goes. So first questioning that. Yeah. And yeah, within the current system, like within, it, yeah, I think it would uh, always be, yeah. Of course, it's it will never be neutral, but this will would still uh, go uh, in favor of a certain part of society in detriment of the other yeah. of the users in this case. I think we have like still time for one or two other uh, questions from the audience. I'd yeah, they're they're playing. This is a nudge for you to keep on moving. Uh. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting panel. Um, I have a question for uh, Steven. So you've presented a very, uh, I would say, computational model of the brain and how it works with the two systems. And with, I don't know, I'm reminded of like long-term, short-term memory and like tasks are automated and stuff like that. Um, I wonder if you could, um, 
say something about what this view of the brain leaves out and also the extent to which it might be less of a reflection of what happens and more of a production of like, are we actually um, making this reality where our brains are computers um, by thinking this way? So, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense, but it's not entirely the topic of the forum, I would say. Yeah. Do you want, still want to reply on the, th on the question or not? No, uh, uh, I'll give I mean, a very short answer. I'll start with actually uh, apologize to the room. I'm usually talking with other scientists. I, I also have a bit of trouble uh, getting the narrative of the questions. So, uh, sorry for that. Um, and then for your answer, no, I guess this is a, from a cognitive, I would say it's a cognitive science description of the brain. And from that perspective, it doesn't leave a lot of out. And it is a perception action model. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Sure, I'll take that. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Is there another question from the audience? No? I have a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, about the camera analytical stu analytica yeah, stuff. Analytica stuff. It's it really. Uh, so uh, there, there were two elements to that story. Not, not your story, but let's say the, the general outrage, at, yeah. at least as far as I got it. One yeah. was that fake news was used, and the other was, was that it was micro targeting. Are both necessary for, let's say, the shock, or is micro-targeting in itself a problem, even if the f news was not fake? Well, I would say that yes, because just because something is fake doesn't mean that it's not conveying a certain narrative and a certain perspective. So micro-targeting uh, in the scale of uh, power asymmetry and information asymmetry is definitely a problem. But yeah, maybe it's not a very nuanced uh, answer, but that's the one I have now, <laughs> okay. with the time we have. <laughs> Vicky, do you want to say something? Yeah, I actually, firstly, I don't think it was the shock was about this because, like, uh, Obama also used micro targeting. He was the first example of how you could use this. But he didn't maybe do it the way Cambridge Analytica did it. I think the shock came that the Russians were involved, which is a very US thing. I think if they weren't involved and it would have been like Clinton, it would have been very different. The, the narrative would have been so different. So I also feel like these discussions are highly politicized because of like these, uh, like the, the context. And then uh, the other thing that people, f I think people were shocked about was that Facebook gave this data to Cambridge Analytica. Whether that was legal or not, I mean, you can debate about it. Uh, but as you said, they were not the only ones who misused this sort of uh, ability uh, to collect data about an individual and all of their friends. Uh, so I think that was then the more other outrage. But I don't think necessarily the micro-targeting or the fake news was actually the reason why people were upset about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's time to... Uh Stop, I see a sign <laughs> pointing at me. That's a very <laughs> obvious nudge. Um, I would th like to thank you all and um, hopefully we can take the conversation um, to the bar or to the other um, program programs this evening. And I would like to thank all the guests. They give them a big applause. <laughs>